and welcome to the MLK Junior Parade. Here, here we are in January 16th, 2023. Let's remember this incredible individual that was our leader in civil rights and moral and in ethics. He talked about peace. He talked about respect. He talked about all the things that are wrong in our society and how we could fix it. It's actually a simple solution. Let's care for one another. Let's change policies that help everybody. And let's just be one great world where everybody counts and people are truly judged by their character and not by the color of their skin. Welcome to No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete, a show that takes a critical look at the disparities between medical school education and society's growing health care inequities. Join Dr. Pedro Cuba Pete Greer each episode as he interviews the experts working to transform medical education and ensuring that future doctors are trained to provide equitable and compassionate health care for all communities. Dr. Greer received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009, honoring his dedication to providing health care to underserved populations. As Dean of Roseman University College of Medicine in Las Vegas, Dr. Greer is committed to creating a medical school of the future where students embrace the need to unite the heart and science of health care. And now, the host of No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete, Dr. Pedro Cuba Pete Greer. Hi everybody, this is, uh, my name is uh, Pedro Joe Greer. I am the Dean at Roseman University College of Medicine. And today on Cuba Pete No Laughing Matter, live, at least for right now, from Studio A in Las Vegas, we have a very special guest. The purpose of what we do here is multifold, to learn about the community and to learn what is it that I have to do in my team to properly prepare physicians for the future and why these different aspects are important, why medicine cannot live in isolation. I am truly, truly honored to have a person that, although I just shared a sandwich with, we didn't share a sandwich, we shared a table. I gave her her own sandwich, I swear to God. That uh, is Clay T. White, an amazing young woman. She is originally from North Carolina, went out to California and came here to Vegas in 92. Got her master's degree at UNLV in history, and in her undergraduate degree, she got at Cal State. She's an author, African-American women migrants, a Las Vegas odyssey, $8 a day in working in the shade and oral history of African-American migrant women in Las Vegas gaming industry. African-American women confront the West, 1600 to the year 2000, of which I have to get. That seems fascinating that book. But more importantly than that, she does something that is so invaluable and her passion. She is director of the Oral History Research Center at UNLV Libraries with projects like early health care in the city, John S. Park neighborhood, musicians that played with other famous musicians. I mean, if I were to give you the list and we'll get into it a little later, we'll do that. But here you have an individual who finds something so important what we take for granted and really don't look into. And we see that so much in our society today. Uh, a friend of mine calls it truth decay. <laughs> you need history. Where did you get your passion for history? I really don't know. 
I think it probably came from my father. My father could not read and write, but he was a storyteller. And he would tell a story so vividly that he could put you at, in that setting. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't realize that that was an art until later on in life. I, I got a bachelor's degree, was not in history. It was in something else that I thought I would want to work in. And eventually I had the time to think about what I wanted to do and decided that I wanted history. I had read some historical fiction and that historical fiction made me start to question, wow, I wonder if that incident really happened and if it happened in that way. Hmm, I'd like to know more about this and that. So I started calling UNLV and trying to, try to just decide, you know, what is black studies? What is black history? Women's history? Women's studies? What's the difference? And I met this woman by telephone who started talking to me. And I eventually enrolled in UNLV and the rest is history because they were teaching oral history at the time. Oh, really? Yes. And Las Vegas itself has a very interesting and scarred history in racial relations, just like the just rest like, of America. Yes. No reason to be any different. That's correct. And you had the riots I, in the, on the West Side, when was that, 69, 70? Yeah, 69 and then 92. And then 92. Yes. 69 was particularly uh, egregious in the sense that the National Guard came in and blocked all the entrances into the West Side, didn't they? That's correct. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Well, there was an incident in the community, and I've heard two iterations of what really happened. But someone was being treated unfairly by police officers on a Sunday afternoon. And that person started protesting against the police officers. And then that started other people in the community not being happy with what was going on. And the riot started. And that went on for two and a half to three days. That evening, they brought in the the uh, National Guard. Yes, the the uh, what do you call those? The armor, the uh, oh. cars, the, the, the tanks, the tanks, and blocked off the streets. And if you think about it, I don't know if you remember, but in 2012. The community was very, very upset because they were going to close F Street mm. and they were going to close F Street permanently. And it was one of the few exits into and out of the West Side. And no one understood why it was so important to that neighborhood that they could not close that street. And it was because of what had happened in 1969 when those streets were closed during the riots. The importance of history. Yes. So we have to know history in order to understand what's happening today. And it's very interesting then, that it's called the West Side, the historic West Side, because it's not West. Well, it's but it west, is west of something. West of the tracks. West of the tracks. That's what made the difference. Because at first, it was just the tracks. Well, in Florida, where I was born and raised, and did much of my uh, early profession, we had similar rules. And one of them was the railroad track. Yes. Blacks were not allowed to live east of the railroad tracks. That's why, which is now US 1, which is inappropriately named Dixie Highway. But that's why you have the African American community on the west side of the highway in South Miami was because they were not allowed to live on the east side of it. And the reason you couldn't live on the east side is the whites got the waterfront. So at first, everybody lived on the east side of the tracks here in Las Vegas. The person who surveyed the property that Helen J. Stewart sold to the railroad back in two, uh, 1904. Isn't she like the mother of Las Vegas? That's correct. She came out here right after her husband died or he died when she came out? He was murdered here. He was murdered here. Yes, he was murdered at the Kyle Ranch. Really? In North Las Vegas. She's a fascinating story. She is very, very. And her relationship with Native Americans yes. and that nation was wonderful. But at first, that area west of the tracks was supposed to be downtown. So J.T. McWilliams, who surveyed the property, 
laid out a town site because he found this property that had not been claimed. He purchased it and laid out a town site. The water was west of the tracks, so he naturally thought that what, that's where downtown was going to be. But in 1905, when the owners of the railroad came to town, they said, oh no, oh no, downtown is gonna be east of the tracks. We're gonna own, own downtown. So everybody took their properties, purchased property on the other side in the real downtown. Of just a few people were left west of the tracks. Everybody else moved east of the tracks. African-Americans lived in and around Block 17. Mm -hmm. That's where the Mob Museum is today. Later, which you, should, you, you were on their board, weren't you? <laughs> I'm still on the board. Are you still on the board? Yeah, I'm still My on wife board. and I checked it out last. Uh, we, we loved it. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Mostly because I saw a lot of relatives' pictures there. But that's, <laughs> just the, I know you, you were not. <laughs> but, but that, it wasn't until the end of the 1920s, the beginning of the 1930s, that African Americans moved west of the tracks. The city said, it's time for us to have more businesses. Whites began to move to the east. They told the blacks that if they wanted to be able to renew their business licenses, they had to move to the west. Wow. So that's how the west side started, as we know it today. As we know it today. Okay. The historic west side. Tell me a little bit about the Moulin Rouge. Huh. So that was not until 1955, and it was the first integrated hotel casino that it could be considered a resort, just like the Sands, the Desert Inn, all of those upscale casinos that we had. So they decided that African Americans are earning great money, so let's get them to spend it. Yeah, let's let's have a place where they can go and enjoy the same level of entertainment. So these three businessmen opened that location right there on Bonanza, just west of H Street. So literally in the black community. And people don't know this when they ask the question because they've heard so much about the Moulin Rouge that it only lasted about five and a half months That's what I heard during that, that heyday period. They bur it burned down, didn't it? Well, but it didn't burn down until much, much later. Oh, okay. It didn't burn down until completely until about 2014. And what was the reason for it closing down after five and a half months? Well, they said it was because the subcontractors were never paid for their work on that building. Some of that could be true, because we, but it was also a downturn in the economy. Okay. The dunes almost went out of business, but they were propped up. The Royal Nevada almost went out of business. It was propped up by the other casino owners in the area. But the Moulin Rouge was not propped up by those same casino owners. And the Moulin Rouge did something that probably caused them not to be propped up in that way. When they decided that they wanted more activity at night, they put on a show at 2.30 in the morning. That show pulled people from the Las Vegas Strip gotcha. in huge numbers. So if you were a gambler and you were going with the star of the show that night with him, gonna hang out with him, he's gonna hang out at the Moulin Rouge. So we know some of that is true because some of the dancers, there were cards at their dressing table. If you're caught at the Moulin Rouge, you lose your job. Really? Yes. Wow. So the, the actual history that occurs and the reasons why bad things happen in history are imperative to teach our future physicians. Number one, because unfortunately my profession is racist. It's sexist, it's xenophobic, it's elitist. So you're just like America? Yes, but we take it to another level. Okay. Okay, because we give them a lot of money. The, uh, we also lack virtues that we should have. Humility, mm -hmm. empathy, compassion. And I have data to back up every one of those statements that I just made to you. And we have to change that. 
the it, it's interesting to me because the first time that we really tried to diversify we did it with gender so we have half of our population of physicians are women 52 percent are me of medical students are women less than 15 percent are in power positions or leadership positions a study that recently came out from rand in santa monica it showed that women doctors make $2 million less in their lifetime than an equal male counterpart. Okay. The statistics get even worse with African Americans and Hispanics. We're elitist because overwhelmingly medical students come from families that are two, three times or even higher of the national income. So how do we get a student to understand all the problems we have in this country. Because the end point of being a, a, a medical educator is not to produce more doctors, but to improve the health of a nation. No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete is sponsored by Roseman University College of Medicine in Las Vegas. We're transforming education by reimagining healthcare and committing to serving the health needs of all communities. And by our generous sponsors listed in the description of this episode. As we were talking earlier, Dick Gregory, who I used to love, mm -hmm. died about 10 years ago, I think, um, <clears throat> once said, the greatest nation, dot, 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 is the healthiest nation. We're not even near that. In 2017, there was a report written, Death of Despair, where for the first time in 100 years in my country and your country, Opposingly, a, an advanced country, morbidity and mortality started to rise. And interestingly, it was led not by blacks or Hispanics, but by non-Hispanic whites. And the importance of all these other policies is that the differentiating factor between the cohorts, the ones that were somewhat stable, and the causes of death were suicide, poisoning or overdose, and alcoholic liver disease, was they didn't go beyond high school. Education. Education makes a huge difference. That's why when we go into the communities where you have a larger population of first generation potential college students, my experience has been they work harder. They need a lot of support because they can't go home and say what's college like or what's med school like. But they become the best physicians I've ever seen. And not only that, we're giving the opportunity for a young individual to be the first one in their family to earn wealth, whether that is paying for your kid's education or owning a house. Mm -hmm. We're going to be dependent on these communities because they're going to teach our students. What do our students need to know about each community before they go in there? First, they need to understand what systemic racism is mm -hmm. and why those communities look the way they look today, why people don't have what you see in other communities. We can start with education. The schools have always been different. There's, there has never been any equity in the education systems. People here migrated from the South, from school systems that would close certain months of the year when blacks had to work in the fields. Mm -hmm. White kids continued to go to school. So, our migrants come from those kinds of backgrounds, a lot of them. We also have migrants coming from all walks of life. We have professionals, we have doctors, lawyers, everybody migrating at the same time. But make, it makes a difference when you haven't had the kind of economic stability in a home. So I can't get the same kind of financing for my, for my small business or for my home like other people can get because my community is redlined, so banks won't loan in the areas where I live, meaning that I cannot accumulate wealth in my household like everyone else can. When you look at medical care, like we are talking about right or, or now. lack of. A lack of medical care. I don't have health insurance. In a lot of cases, like other people have health insurance in their communities. So I don't get the kind of health care. I don't have the same kind of food because I don't have the same kind of jobs you have. The Hoover Dam here, 
20,000 jobs over that four and a half to five year period of, of dam construction. 20,000 jobs during the Great Depression where everybody is migrating for those jobs. 44 black men get jobs on that dam. Are you kidding me? No. So that's what it looks like. And this is a federal job. These are federal jobs. So even though there are federal funds, it makes no difference. And these are banks, federal banks, that are redlining against me as well. So every institution that I have to deal with every day of my life, there is racism built into that system that treats me differently than someone sitting beside me in my classroom. And so it's important for the students to understand systemic racism, including systemic racism in medical education. That's correct. As well as within the profession itself, to have a better understanding so that when they go to understand the history of the community they're going to be working in, and they have to. They have to. And if they're in a Hispanic community, they also have to understand the history of where people come from. That's correct. And they, they have to know that that migration starts back at the beginning of Las Vegas as well, and that there's a Bracero program that starts early on as well. And men from Mexico come here to work on the railroads and all kinds of other jobs. But as soon as we don't need them anymore, we send them back to Mexico because they're not legal anymore. So it's that kind of history that we have to start learning about. It's interesting to be uh, living in a country of immigrants that just doesn't like them. And we're all immigrants, except, we, except for the Native Americans. Except for the Native Americans mm -hmm. and, and, and a, a significant percentage of African Americans. They didn't migrate here because they wanted oh, to. Oh, we didn't migrate at all. <laughs> but, you were but brought. We were, but, we are, but we are still here and we don't understand some of our history either. So we need to look back. At well, the and, and also the, the entire, uh, I mean, when you look at the film industry, mm -hmm. and how often do you see a, an African American in a Western film? As if they didn't exist during. And we were either 20 to 25% of the cowboys. I... We don't know that. Wow. We have to know our history. And some of the most, um, some of the cowboys that stood out most in his history were Mexican. Really? Oh yeah. And they were the ones that were so proficient with the, the roping and all of that. Well, you know in the South how a white Southern person is called a cracker. Yes. You know where that comes from? I have no idea. The Spaniards and their whip. They oh. would crack because the Spaniards brought the horses to Florida. Ah. Oh. And so that's where that term comes from. See, and that term bothers me because that whip was used to whip enslaved people. 100%. Yeah. 100%. So, going beyond teaching this to students, they have to be taught by people of color. All colors, white, brown, and black. Okay. If somebody's really sick, we'll take a green person too, but that's only if they ate my mother-in-law's cooking. But uh, you can laugh, it's funny. <laughs> I'm not a cook, so, <laughs> so that's not funny. <laughs> but what it does is twofold. Number one, the student body ref reflects what society is. Mm -hmm. a, a school should be as diverse as the community that they're in. Number two, when we go into these communities where the students are learning with the household center care model, all of a sudden, there's a kid there that says, wow. They look like me. I could be a dentist, I could be a doctor, I could be a nurse, I could be a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Or they have my accent. I can do that too. Mm -hmm. Because it, it must be difficult growing up when you go to healthcare facilities and you never see anybody that looks like you. I didn't even see people who looked like me on television. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. It was, just, it was a, a good friend of mine, actually my roommate in college's older brother, who was the creator of Que Pasa USA. Okay. Which was the first time you had something in Spanish. So you had the, the grandparents that spoke only Spanish, the parents that spoke Spanglish, mm -hmm. and the kids that could barely speak Spanish. 
And that was what Miami was at the time, mm -hmm. or New York, yes. or Chicago, or LA, or even out here. Mm -hmm. But you never saw that reflected. So it's time for us to change that. It is time for us to change that. So UNLV is doing something called cluster hiring. Yes, I know that very well. So, and I think it, it makes sense because when you bring one person of color into a department and they're the only one, how long are they gonna stay? I know. And cluster hiring, by the way, in academia is you hire an entire team. Yes. That's, that's what cluster hiring mm -hmm. is. And uh, when it's done for that reason, it's good. Exactly. Unfortunately, at universities, they do cluster hiring for other reasons. So tell me what those are. Big grants. Okay, okay. That makes sense. You know, mm -hmm. and so when you bring them, you bring them all the money that they have. Mm -hmm. And so that's incredible. Do you have brothers and sisters? Oh, eight of us. Eight? <laughs> all right. We, we grew up as sharecroppers. So we need a lot of people to work in the field. You grew up in North Carolina? North Carolina. I have five brothers and two sisters. Wow. Mm -hmm. And are any of them in academics like you are? No. No. They were all smarter. They did things to earn more money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're the happiest one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No, but I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. Well, not only are you passionate about it, but this community feels the same way too because she is the first recipient of the K.T. White Community Advocate Award. <laughs> she won in 2021 the Historic Preservation Award and in 2019 the Nevada Humanities Award and a list that goes on and on. And she's a board member of Women of Diversity, the Mob Museum. Now, this one I was curious about was blackpass.com. What is that? It is the biggest online website for knowledge about the black experience, the African-American black experience, as well as the African black experience. It comes out of the University of Washington, but it is really wholly owned uh, by a professor, Quintar Taylor. That is blackpass.com. Yes. So look that up. And it's interesting, it's coming out of uh, University of Washington, because if we remember our history correctly, Oregon, just north, was the only state in the country that in its original charter did not allow blacks to live there. Wow, I didn't know that. And so that's why what happened in Portland was so particularly important. Exactly, and yeah, wow. I can look at that differently now. So I'm gonna say this, ask you this question now because we're being taped. Okay, good. When we invite you to come speak to our students and to educate <laughs> our faculty, can I get you there? Definitely, I'm there. There. You are such a treasure to this community and actually to this world. And I gotta say, you have the most pleasant smile <laughs> I have ever seen. That's why I know you're a Southern girl. I am happy, <laughs> I am happy, I'm happy with my work. It makes me feel good that I can share what I'm doing with other people. Well, one of the great, great quotes, of many great quotes, of the uh, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was, "Your life begins to end when you start to when you stop doing something that mat to matters to other people." Yeah. And it's that giving of what you're doing and the preservation. And so we got to make sure. For, okay, our medical school makes sure you're around for another 200 years because we got history coming down. <laughs> Okay. So, and so and it's UNLV that does the preservation of everything that the Oral History Research Center does outside in the community. So UNLV has this team of geniuses that preserves everything and makes it accessible. And the, uh, it was funny, my wife's, uh, we've been married 41 years. She says the best three years of her life. <laughs> the, uh, to her, we, we love to read, so we mm -hmm. have huge libraries in mm -hmm. our house. And uh, her biggest disappointment was, why aren't the kids going to the library more? Oh. I said, because everybody gets it online. Oh. Yeah. But what UNLV is doing, it needs to be applauded. My wife takes those Ostner courses with them too. So, oh, wonderful. So, so mm -hmm. she has found that very, very, very enriching. Yeah. And uh, 
Clay T., I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be here today. Well, I think with the gift that you are, the, first the gift that your parents gave you and your father by telling you stories. Because I'm Cuban-Irish of all combinations, okay. but what do you do in an island? You tell a story. And from an oral history perspective, that is the most important story to hear. That's correct. And it stays sort of consistent throughout the generations. Only if you're talking about yourself catching the winning touchdown pass as a change. <laughs> but the, the oral history is not only so important for a child to hear that. Yeah. And, and the story is the basis of all culture. Yes. We can't have music. We can't have dance. can't have opera unless you have that story. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. It is such an honor to have you here. Wonderful to be here. And it is a true pleasure that I can now say, I know Miss White. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, from Studio A in Las Vegas, we're learning how to better educate our future workforce of doctors and at the same token, the importance of history in your community. I remember saying back in college, for those who forget history are damned to repeat it. Yeah. So with that, live from Studio A, or it is live right now, thank you very much for listening. Please subscribe, like, and comment on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to support the groundbreaking work that Dr. Greer is doing at the Roseman University College of Medicine, please donate at the link below. Thanks for tuning in to No Laughing Matter with Cuba Pete, as together we work to unite the heart and science of healthcare to serve all in our communities. See you next time. <laughs>